And we are on the air, Pops. What time is it? It's Chuck time. Yes, it is. Hello, everyone. Hello, one. Hello, all. Hello, Gator fans. I am Mike. That is Pops. This is the Chop Time Podcast. Episode three, I have dubbed Swamped. Episode three, we were swamped. Uh, Greetings. We are going to try and keep this positive. There is going to be some negative involved. It's going to be about a 30-minute episode. We have three segments. First off, uh, Pops wanted to start off with a brief synopsis of what happened on Saturday from each of us. Then we will move on to stats and predictions and followed by ending off the episode with solutions, our opinions of the solutions moving forward for the program. Are you good with that, Pops? I'm ready. All right, so I'm going to start with you. You requested this. You wanted a couple minutes right off the top. Go ahead. I've been a Gator fan for over 59 years, and I'm still a Gator fan. Just like the song says, in all kinds of weather, we have our ups, we have our downs. I was on the board listening and and, and reading everybody's comments right after the game. Look, we're Gators. It's not always positive, but you got to be a Gator, okay, and not a Gator hater. We can talk about all kinds of things about whether the offense was right, whether the coach was right, whatever, okay? But the thing is, we're still Gators, and we got to remain Gators. We got to stay positive. It's a long season. We got 11 more games. A lot of things can happen. It's a crazy time. So let's just stay positive. That's my thing today. Hey, I'll have some criticism later, but I'm a Gator. Let's stay positive. Back to you. So that's your synopsis. That's your synopsis. My synopsis is heavily disappointed with everything around. Anybody that's been following me in my posts on the Facebook Gator groups, I was up and down just like everyone else the last two days. And when it comes down to it, emotion taken kind of out a couple days in between what we saw and what we experienced. Disappointed, upset with a multitude of things. The fans, including me, I'm sick of hearing fire, fire, fire. We'll get to that in a minute. And who you think we should replace him with and all that. We'll get to that. But the execution was a joke. We were gaslit during the offseason as to how good this team was. It's one game. I think Miami is very good. Very good. I don't think that they're going to lose. They might not lose a game. Their schedule is not... We talk about the preseason rankings, and obviously Florida State was way ranked way higher than they should have been. But I think for the most part, most of those teams up there played, you know, to their talents and played to their rankings. So most of the rankings are correct. There'll be some outliers, and Florida State was one of them. Miami's schedule, they don't play anybody ranked currently other than Florida State. So I think with their talent and their coaching, they'll probably go undefeated. More than likely, they're going to the playoffs. Having said that, had they brought in the 2012 Alabama team or whatever the most dominant Alabama team was in the last 20 years, I would have still been disappointed with our game plan, which we'll get into. I still would have been disappointed with a lot of our players' efforts It almost looked like a bunch of them had quit by the end of the game. There's definitely some improving to do, but it is just one game. So back to what you said, I love the Gators. I'm not going to root against them like some people out there will, because if we lose to Sanford, he will be fired by Monday. If we lose to Sanford, he will be. I'm pretty sure he will be. You agree with that? Yes, but we're not losing to Sanford. Well, we're not going to lose to Sanford. But I'm never going to root against the Gators for the good of our future. That is correct. I I do not believe in that. I'm going to be very harsh with them. I will be straight up, like we said, very honest. We're not going to sugarcoat anything. We'll get into this later. We'll get into this later. But one thing, okay? What does LSU, Texas A&M, 
Florida Gators all have in common that they were really defeated by. The most important position on the field. Quarterback? Quarterback. And you can look at Florida State. Quarterback. If you don't have a solid, top-tier quarterback, it's not good. <coughs> it's, it's not good. I agree. It's it's the most it's for decades. It's been the most important position on any team sport is quarterback of a football team, and not just how you play, but how you lead, how you talk, Correct. how you carry yourself. It's the most important position in all of team sports. So I agree with that. All right. So our brief synopsis is: yours was keep the once, faith. Once once a Gator, all always a Gator. Keep faith. Mine is once a Gator, always. A gator, but disappointed. That's very good. Synopsis. Very Let's good. go into the predictions and stats. Woo! I gotta That's tell good. you, our credibility is hanging by a thread. <laughs> oh, we, we were wrong on just about everything we said, except for the keys to the game, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. But our over unders, we both had Cam Ward. The Miami quarterback under 300 yards all purpose. He had over 385 yards passing and he had 33 yards rushing. He, on three attempts. he, he looked solid. Very, solid. very polished, very good. Yeah. Uh, we had both the over for Damian Martinez rushing at 100 yards. He only had 65 yards rushing. Well, part of that was because they were having so much, you know, success passing the ball, they really didn't have to run. Yeah. 15 for 65 for their best running back, who's a really good back. It's still over four yards a carry, which is what most running backs are looking for. Maybe in college you're looking for five or six. 4.3. Oh, but we were wrong for the, on that. Trey yep. Wilson, one and a half touchdowns. I had the under. I was right, but I still said I thought he would score. You thought he would score two or two. more. Yeah. So we were base, both basically wrong on that as well because we both thought he would score. Oh, it was horrible. We both had... Over for the Gator points of 27. We only scored 17, so we were wrong on that. We both had the under for Miami points of 27. They had 41. We were wrong on that. I didn't, I was working. In game Tebow references, do you remember? Was it over four and a half? No, it was not. Okay, so you had the under. You were right on that. The announced crowd, I believe we were over 90,000 in the stadium to Correct. begin the game. Correct. In the third quarter, we probably had less of that. Uh, after the after the Tom Petty song, it was gone. Yeah. So we were both right in the announced crowd. We knew it was going to be um, a full capacity, and it was. Scuffles? I didn't see any scuffles. None. Like, major scuffles. There was pushing and stuff. There was a bunch of trash talk, mostly by Miami, which, ugh. But if we can do the Gator Shop, they can do the Gator Shop. Most teams that have done the Gator Shop early in games of the Swamp, it comes back to bite their ass. It did not in this game. They continued yeah. the entire game. Yeah. The Miami players talked to the enormous amount of committed recruits and commits and com and recruits that were just visiting. That hurt us quite a bit, I'm sure. They had every right to do though, so they ran up and down the field on us, right? Yep. So the, the scuffles was under two and a half. That was you. In shots of the national title corner. Do you remember that? It was only a couple times, right? Not even. Maybe once. Once. So once. We both had the under of three and a half. So we got that right. I predicted 34-24 Gators. You predicted 31-17 Gators. Obviously, we were both wrong there. What I will say, what we were right about was the keys to the game. Oh, the keys to the game, we, we basically came up with four between us. Yes. The first one was turnovers, which turned out to be irrelevant. We had two, but one of them was after the game was already done, and it was a lucky interception by them. And they had one turnover that kept us in the game for a quarter or two. The one, uh, the one interception by Shamar somewhat early in the game kept yeah. us in the game. Yeah. Ultimately, the turnovers were irrelevant. The trenches was number two we both agreed on. Extremely important. They let me, dominated. Let me just say this. For years, I've been asking, okay, 
for an offensive and defensive line. You look at all the great teams that have played over the last two decades. They have offensive, defensive lines that all go to the NFL. Our line was so dominated on both sides of the ball, it was horrendous. I don't even know if we have defensive ends because no one even got close to that quarterback, okay? And we're blitzing 25 yards out, which was ridiculous, okay? But we had no push on this quarter, none. And then he could just move around wherever he wanted to go. He was camping back there, and nobody was touching him. Offensively, it wasn't as bad as defensively. But, you know, if you look at the 71-yard run by Montrell, okay, after that he averaged, you know, 3.5 yards a carry. I mean, it's not like they were pushing him and helping him out a little bit. We got no push either side. None. Zero. I mean, if I you didn't know. Go ahead. I don't even know what Joey Slackman's number is. I don't know. I heard I about know. all offseason about how great, how we got this defensive tackle from Pennsylvania to the Northeast that everybody wanted as a transfer, and he was dominant up there. I don't even know what his number is. I think he had one assist for a tackle. It, it, it was horrendous. I mean, a running backs. I mean, I'm looking at the running backs here. I mean, it was, you know, if you take the 71 yards out with 68 yards, I mean, it's like, really? I mean, nothing. We had no yards. I mean, really passing. I mean, you know, Graham had... 91 yards passing. I mean, it was, it was atrocious. Uh, it it was, looked like it looked like they they were in our huddle. There was a couple plays where we ran right, and there were three guys waiting for us. Yeah, right there. Yeah, it was strange. That the, but that goes to we'll, we'll trenches, get to that in a minute. The trenches we'll were bad. In, in the trenches, they pushed us around on both sides of yeah. the ball. Yeah, Graham Merce got hit. He probably had more than one concussion in that game, but he got hit, lit up a few times. And that affects the quarter, any quarterback's mindset right. Right. and his internal clock for sure. Yeah. Cam Ward drops back, and it almost looked – I was watching the game without the sound at work, and it almost looked like at times I thought, was there a whistle blown? Because Cam just kind of stepped back and just kind of looked over the field. I'm like, was the – he was very relaxed in the pocket. I saw no – yeah, and the blitzes for, were from way back and way too late and from directions where he could easily see where they were coming from. It was odd. I thought it was you know, odd. Going, going about the blitzes, too, I, I want to bring this part up. because It, it might be later, but we'll talk about it now. The one thing that, that, that uh, the coach has done and instilled in these players from previous coaches, okay, is needless penalties. You know, a normal Gator team... He has anywhere from 8 to 12 penalties a game. You know how many penalties we had on uh, Saturday? Two. And you know what they've the passer. Correct. Both times we could have gotten ourselves out of trouble, but both times, again, you know, it's foolish. It's just foolish to do penalties, and it really hurt us. Yes, didn't need to didn't need to touch him. You were two steps away. Right. I don't care if you barely touched him, if you did push him. You were two steps away. It was third down. You are playing all out. I know it's not easy to stop from 100, you know, 100 miles an hour to zero. I know it's not easy. But you're on third down. You cannot have those penalties. It now turns out that they have more talent on both sides of the ball. With that being the case, you, you don't have to play a perfect game, but you can't play a stupid game. And that first penalty by Boone was a horrendous penalty. Hated it. Hated it. I don't care what, if it was close to being late or he barely touched them or the ACC refs were favoring them for whatever reason. Don't even touch them. So that, that penalty hurt us. Now let's All go right. to keys to the game. Three was basically me, Mertz, and his leadership. I saw before the game, he was in the middle of a big group of Gators yelling and everything. It looked like he was trying to lead the game, lead the team before the game. When the game started, he looked lost from the get-go. From the opening snap, he did not look like Graham Mertz that I saw last year for the majority of the year. He was late on throws. He was, it looked like the defense confused him quite a bit. 
didn't know who was coming from where, didn't know who he thought was going to be open. When he made decisions, his throws were high. They were late. Listen, the run. He had a couple times where he stepped up in the pocket, and that was good. But he looked like a guy that had just transferred from Wisconsin, did not have one and a half years under that system. He looked listen, lost. Listen, I, I I was watching some of the routes because, you know, we've been criticized and, and of our receivers not running the routes, okay? Most of those passes that he overthrew, these guys were open, and they ran the route, but he just didn't have any connection at all in this game. Zero. None. No, it was bad. It was and, bad. And as a quarter, as a starting quarterback, I don't care what level you are, but especially a quarterback that's been big time football for six years now. Yeah, as a starter. Yeah, you need to know. And at home, you need to know what the play clock is. There were two or three times, definitely, that I saw him not know what the play clock was. Listen, Listen you have to have grasp of all that that's part of leadership that's part of playing the most important position of all of sports he did and, not have that and i'm glad you brought that up because that was one of my ta- talking points about Mertz. and also the next thing we're going to talk about coach okay they hit a field goal they kicked off touchback there's a tv timeout we're ready okay we're back on we couldn't get the playoff after a touchback at a commercial and we had a call timeout. It's just unacceptable on a timeout that you can't get a play. I mean, you're always the one telling me, we should be two or three plays in our head. Let's go. Get these plays out there. We even got now Mike's in the quarterback's helmet up to 15 seconds. There's the timeout. We talk on the sideline. We go to the line of scrimmage, and we can't hike the ball. It's unacceptable. Agreed. And he's got a, yes, he's got a staff of a hundred dudes. He's probably got 20 guys on offense alone. They scored. So there was all that time. Then there was a commercial. You still had the kickoff. And then all that time you get up to the line and you have no idea what you're doing. You don't have the right personnel and you don't have the right calling. It's, it's unacceptable. Even if it's, even if it's game one, I don't like it. Do you know what else that bothers me is that when the turnover or when the when they turn the ball over, not turn the ball over, when it's their turn to get the ball, we huddle on the bench, and then we get to the line of scrimmage with like 15 seconds to go. What 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 is that all about? Okay, can't you before the play, before we get the kick, before the punt or a kickoff, can we talk then? And as soon as it's ready, you go out into the field. But no. We talk on the sideline, and we huddle on the sideline, and then we go out there with 15 seconds to go. So if they change their defense, now the kid's trying to figure out, now what am I going to call now? But he doesn't have that much time. Of course. It's horrendous. Horrendous. It brings us right into Napier's game plan was your big thing. It's a huge part of the game, a huge key to the game, is going to be Napier's game plan. And I will let you... Spew out your venom here for a minute listen, or two listen, on his game plan. Listen, that was one of my biggest, biggest things on the on our keys to the game was his game plan. This game plan, okay? He said all summer, figure this out. Get your twenty plays. Let's go. Ready to go. This is the same friggin' game plan I've seen forever. It's the same old stuff. There's nothing new here. It's it's. Okay, we're gonna throw a little pass to the sideline, a little pass. We're gonna do a, a flanker screen. I mean, it's like, what what are we doing? I mean, there's no imagination in this game plan. As the game went on, there's no reverses. There's no double reverse. Give back to the quarterback. Throw it down. There's none of that. This guy has absolutely. I, I don't know how he did it at his other schools, but this guy has no imagination whatsoever. There was nothing there. It's the same old thing. These teams know us, and they know this guy has has no idea what he's doing as far as the game plan. It's, it was horrendous. Listen, he had eight months to prepare for one team, and he knew the entire... They had no big injuries. Actually, their best defensive player got hurt in the first 
right. series that didn't come back, but that right. didn't seem to matter. But they had a new quarterback for eight months. Yeah, but he's got film. He's yes. three different. I, he's got plenty I, of film. I, I, we I had, had, from what I could tell, I did not see any new place. Maybe there were some little wrinkles here. That I saw no new plays. No. I saw no new strategies as far as tempo goes. I saw nothing. I, I don't believe he even had a plan to get DJ in the game. For just the, a, the tight end had one pass. One. Yeah. One I, pass. I, I, don't, I don't think Napier had a plan to get DJ in the game where he absolutely should have a package for this guy if Mertz is healthy and Mertz is playing well. Even if Mertz is healthy and playing well, he needs to have a package for the the most important recruit we've had in 20 year, 15 years, every single game, even if it's a couple plays to get his feet wet. I don't think he even had a plan to play him. It didn't look like he had a plan to play him. Maybe he did. Maybe it was coming. It, but it was horrendous. Our plays looked exactly the same. Our strategies looked exactly the same, both on offense and defense. We'll probably hit on it at some point here. We'll get on it now. Billy Napier is a wet mop. If you're winning, good. But football is an emotional game. And your team, no matter who, what sport you coach for, usually a good team is a reflection of the coach, correct? It is a complete reflection of the coach. That's what it, that's what it is. Yeah, he's, he's got nothing. Every now and then he looks concerned. He looks baffled. You know, he'll take somebody aside. I'm not a big fan of undressing your... Uh, referees every five seconds like Dabo does or Saban did or undressing one of your players, you know, swearing at your players like Jim McElwain did to Kelvin Taylor that one year. I thought that was a little bit over the top. I do need more emotion than Napier is showing me a lot more emotion well, and not only on the field. All you, you have to, all you have to do is look at the damn press conference. Okay? Yes. Yeah. I looked at just, the press conference. I looked at the press conference with Kelly. I looked at the press conference with Texas A&M. I looked at the press conference of FSU. These guys show emotion. They were visibly, visibly upset, not only with themselves, but with their team. I it's see like, none of that. Yes, and it's the same old cliches. We've got some things to clean up. Listen, you're playing. You're not playing against the constant. The other team is trying to beat the hell out of you, just like you're trying to beat the hell out of them. You're not playing against the constant. Most of the things that happened, I don't even know where to go, but his press conferences are the same. We've got things to clean up. Got another opportunity <laughs> coming up on Saturday. He's going to talk up Sanford. He loves the coach there and blah, 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 blah. Hey. And zero emotion. And then he, makes a, then he makes a comment about <laughs> somebody in the basement of Florida. Right. One, there are no basements in Florida, Billy. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> Number two. Yeah, we're going to say a bunch of things. It's 2024. Like it or not, social media is a part of our national landscape, and especially so with sports. Can if I you don't like it, put a better product on the field. Use the eight months you had. You could have just had 40 plays, all brand new, and ran those 40 plays into the ground on the offensive side of the ball for eight months. Can I, can I just make one comment? And this will, in a synopsis, okay? I'm watching Billy's press conference. And it was hysterical to the point where he gets a bottle of water, okay? He spent two minutes trying to open that bottle like that. Trying to open a bottle of water. He couldn't do it. And he finally just took the bottle and put it on the stand. I mean, it's like... There was no emotion at all. He couldn't open the friggin' bottle. I would have taken the bottle of water and thrown it somewhere. I mean, it this thing tells me nothing. It's a microcosm of how he presents himself as a coach. If you're winning, it's genius. If you're losing, you look like a complete buffoon. And, and, and as you said, listen, criticism is coming, buddy. This is the way this the life works. This is the way the world works, okay? You get praised when you're good. When you're bad, you're going to get criticism. Don't come back at it. Just take it and move on. Because uh, he, once he, you he, say something about a basement in Florida, listen, you're you're creating more more for these these trolls to go after you. Yes, I guess every every 
fan base out there is going to have haters and thousands of them, the big schools. Right. I think our problem as fans is we are easily top five most toxic fan base in the country. Part of that is because we were spoiled by the spurrier success of just blowing out everybody in the SEC for a while, getting that title. That Urban comes in and his recruiting classes were out of this world. And then we were dominating for that two, three year stretch. And then he was gone and all of a sudden we're average. So part of it is being spoiled, but I don't mind having big expectations. I don't mind shooting for the moon, shooting for the stars. We do have a toxic fan base. We got to stop, you know, immediately saying fire a guy. No, yeah, but this is, no. but this is your, but listen, this is year three. I think let's go right into the solutions. My first solution is we're going to have to take this week by week. Now he has used all the rope or all the leash he has with Gator nation and rightfully so his first two years, he was under 500. We lost games we could have won. He did not make a ton of great coaching decisions or strategies or schemes. This is year three. I do believe we have the most talent on the team currently than we had in his first previous two years. But at this point, we are now week to week. If he loses somehow to Sanford, which I don't believe he's going to do, I think we're going to blow them out. But week to week, if he loses to Sanford, he's done. Then you guys can all talk about, all right, who are we going to replace him with? Let but me, it's not, we're not, we're close, but we're not there yet. He is okay. our head coach. Listen, just let me say a couple things. We're, we're probably going to blow out Sanford as we should. I think DJ needs to play the next two games, whether Mertz is healthy or not. DJ gets the next two games. He gets a, an, you know, an undermanned Sanford team. And then our next game after that, we're home. Against a and which A&M. is an SEC opponent. Yeah. Those are my two um, solutions moving forward is that we're week to week and we see what happens and DJ starts the next two games and finishes them without injury, obviously, regardless, and, and see if this dude in the most important position on our team and in sports is a difference maker. That's my first two solutions, yours. Okay. All right. Here's what I want. Okay, I'm going to go right one one for the offense and one for the defense. Okay, okay. for the offense, I want to hurry up offense. I am sick and tired of us looking back, but just let's hurry this thing up. Do you look at all the successful teams out there? They're all doing hurry up offense at some point in the game. We just lag for days to go out there, and it's like we don't even know sometimes. We're down to four seconds before he's making a decision to get the ball. And the other thing is, we're in the SEC. This ain't a running league anymore. It's a passing league. Everybody, you look at the most successful quarterbacks that are coming out of the SEC. They're all great passers, okay? I want to create a passing offense, and then we can run. It doesn't work anymore for us to run and then try to pass. No, I want to pass, 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 and I want to hurry up offense. A couple things. Number one, the only big play we had was a running play, Pops. You have to acknowledge that. In the SEC, Alabama was very dominant for a long time and still are. And they've had five stars all over the field. And that certainly includes running back and offensive line. They've had running back after running back. After, you have to have, you can throw the ball all over the field, but it only happens if you have the ability to run. Have you have you, we, have you seen Georgia, LSU, and Alabama? They had a special the other night on those three teams on receivers that are playing in the NFL. Oh, my God. It's ridiculous. Yes, yes but Alabama. Is, listen, I understand the running back, but I'm tired of it. We need to be passing the ball. And my second thing is defense. Now, you're not going to like this, but I don't care. This is what I would do, okay? I said one of the keys I didn't want to, I, not one of the keys, one of the things I didn't want is I don't want to get beat deep. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. We get beat all the time deep. It's ridiculous. And I'm sick of, well, I thought that was your guy. Wasn't that your guy? You're playing that zone. Nobody knows. That. Listen, you know what I want to do? I want to jam these guys at the line of scrimmage, okay? And I want to run a man-to-man. I don't care anymore. Zones are not doing anything for us. 
if we're if we're not good enough to play man on man most of the game, not all the game, most of the game. I want man on man. We're we're not, and I think they're doing both coverages, and we're getting beat both ways. The zone is ridiculous. These guys are wide open on the zone, wide open. At least a man to man. We're next to the guy. Okay, I'll give you that. We're next to him, but I'm sick of these zones. That that touchdown where it went in between two guys and they both looked at each other. Oh, whose whose guy was that? That's what's the problem with the zone sometimes because they screw it up because the other team is smart enough too and they'll put something else in there and then nobody knows where they're supposed to go. Do a damn man on man, and if we lose, we lose. Let me finish with the following because we're just about up here. Defensively, I'm not really sure what the answer is because Miami might be they very well could have the best offensive top five offensive line in the country so anything we were doing wasn't working because of how good they are I don't know we got to take this week to week from the defensive side of the ball maybe if we prove that we cannot get to the quarterback we drop eight in the coverage and and you try and find a hole in there and that's the best way we can go about it and maybe one of our three guys up front wins occasionally I don't know as far as offense goes, I agree wholeheartedly, 100% with tempo. I've been watching football for 40 years, and it seems to me it, it's probably not easy at all to implement or to coach or to execute, but when I see teams in tempo getting up to the line right away, it always seems that the defense gets more tired than the offense somehow, even though they're all running the same amount. Yeah. The defense is on their heels. Almost every team I see in tempo. Now, it only works, really, if you get that first first down. So you got to get a couple good plays in to get the tempo going. But almost every team I see, tempo works. Tempo where I agree wholeheartedly we should go completely into tempo and see how that pans out. Because what we've been doing the last three years, the last two years plus one game in Billy's system is not working. So Correct. that's what I think we should do moving forward. Hope still abound. Sanford comes in. This is a team that put 50 points on us the last time they were here. And Mullen was dancing in the locker room, even though we, I think it was 72 to 50 was the final, but we let that team score 50 on us. It was an embarrassment to our defense. Let's hope part of that film is shown to our defense and let's man up. Let's show a little pride uh, in yourselves. You know, Shut us all up out here. Shut us all up. Who wants to step up and have thousands of us say, there you go, Shamar. Shamar is rocking right now. Or Jason, Marshall looking a lot better than he did last year. Who's going to step up on both sides of the ball? I think we start, DJ, regardless of, you know, Mertz is going through the concussion protocol. You could even use it as, a, as an excuse, lie to us, whatever you want to do. I think the best thing for us to do right now is to see how good this five-star could be. I'm not saying he's going to run up and down the field on everybody, but there should be flashes. Agreed? Agreed 100%. All right. Well, it was a hey, tough start. To the I'm a Gator, and I'll always be a Gator, but I, I can criticize too. Yeah, it was a tough start to the year. Very disappointing, especially given what we were told and what we were expecting to happen. Miami's a really good team. Let's let's go game by game here. And I personally think Billy will not survive the season. I'm rooting for the Gators. I want us to win every game here on out. I'm not going to root for us to lose. So for the long term of the, the, the program, I'm going to root for us to win every game and let the chips fall where they may. Amen. Go Gators. So this, was, this was episode three of the Chop, po Chop Time podcast. I am Mike. That is Pops. This was episode three, Swans. We will see you again on Friday. We'll break down the Stanford game, which should be a blowout and back to Gator glory. Go Gators.